How awesome was that? You know, it's not too often that, you know, we see our young adults in this preventative, like low barrier space come up and really talk about this journey to give everyone that came here today a little bit more perspective of what really the work that happens at the young adult access center level. So without further ado, on behalf of DMH and the SIA team, we are so excited to announce our facilitators today. Please welcome Mirko Chardon and Jessica Castro. Combined, they bring a wealth of experience, passion, and culturally connecting, teaching, and building workforce development. Mirko Chardon is Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer at Novak Education, and Jessica Castro is the Vice President of Programs and Operations at the Treffler Foundation. Collaboratively, they will deliver this powerful keynote to help support young adults' mental wellness through a racial equity lens. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Jessica Chardon and Mirko Chardon. I mean, Mirko Chardon and Jessica Castro, I apologize. When I say speak, you say hope. Speak. Hope. Speak. I think we need a little bit more power and passion with that. We just had young people up here that were sharing their hearts and sharing tremendous energy. So let's try that again. When I say speak, you say hope. Let's try to shake this building. Speak. Hope. Speak. Hope. What do you think, Jess? Lots of hope. All I hear is hope. Thank you for responding back in that way. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to quickly introduce ourselves and then we're going to start rocking and rolling. Um, again, I am Marco Chardon. I'm currently serving in the capacity of being the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer at Novak Education. I am the co-author of the best-selling Equity by Design, and before that, I spent about 20 years in the field in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as the school leader, um, leading various schools in Cambridge, Boston, and Randolph. And I always love sharing with audiences of folks who are going to engage with young adults that I'm also an active practicing hip-hop artist. And I love sharing that component because it's a reminder to all of you that the person that you are in your personal lives is exactly the same person that you are in your professional lives. And that, and particularly for those of us who've committed to supporting other human beings, we have to develop that metacognitive ability to see ourselves as we authentically are when we engage and do the work so that we don't unintentionally manifest as a barrier that we don't unintentionally show up and say, hey, I just want you to pay attention to that one small slice, while all the other human beings that we engage with see the full magnitude of who we are. And I'm gonna allow my dynamic colleague to introduce herself. Thank you, Milk. Can y'all hear me? My name is Jessica Castro. Uh, as Milk mentioned, I am the Vice President of Programs and Operations at the Treffler Foundation. All that means is I give away money and I manage money, um, essentially. Prior to that, I spent about 20 years in the field, in community, working with, I started my career actually um, at Community Resources for Justice, if anyone doesn't know. It's a pre-release program. I worked with inmates from uh, the federal uh, penitentiary all the way down to parolees. And really my, my, my world uh, reminded me every day is how do I help this person see hope after being released from prison? How do I help this person be successful? What does success mean in that work that we do every day? I spent about five and a half years at um, CRJ and then moved on to Morgan Memorial Goodwill. Again, lots of hope. I was helping and supporting women who were reentering the workforce after having children and having very limited time frames to sort of be successful. Again, what does success mean for them? How do we get them off this hamster wheel um, uh, of societal pressures of, of needing a job but you get a job and then you have this cliff effect and what does that look like how do I help them really think about long term what is two years down the road look like for you how do we make sure that when these two years are up and your benefits are gone that you're gonna be strong and sort of steadfast in that I then went on and spent about two years as a MECL director um, Two years were very short-lived, and I think equity and equality is the words that I use when I think about my two years at MECO. Um, and so I knew that 
everywhere I show up at, I'm gonna show up as me. I'm gonna show up as the little girl who needed services then. How do I make sure that these folks that I'm working with feel supported? And so hope is me, I am hope. Um, and I make sure that when I do show up in spaces that I'm providing hope for young people. Norms and some ground rules for our conversation today. And we frame it as a conversation because it's not just gonna be about us. We're gonna drive this slideshow and share some content but it's really gonna be about the conversations that you have amongst yourselves that allow us to have a positive and powerful experience this morning. So first and foremost, we're asking you to stay engaged. We live in a world and society where there are temptations to have your attention go in different directions all the time. I know my cell phone goes off with texts and news alerts and emails and things that draw me in different directions. But I promise you, if we hold this time sacred, we're gonna have a powerful experience because that second norm is expecting each and every single one of you to speak your truths with no shame, blame, or judgment. That means it's okay to ask questions, it's okay to disagree, it's okay to push back. We are not trying to silence any voices. We wanna ensure that there's a safe enough space, a brave enough space for us to all be seen and heard in the ways that work for us. Now, since we're asking you all to speak your truths, we also want to highlight the fact that sometimes when we ask other individuals to share their authentic experiences and perspectives with us, we experience some discomfort, which doesn't mean that anything bad has taken place. But sometimes we hear experiences, we hear perspectives, we hear ideas that are different than our own. We hear perspectives, experiences, and ideas that push us outside of our comfort zone. So we want to signpost right now that you should prepare to experience that. And when you do, it simply means that you're being pushed beyond the limits of your current mental operating model and making connections in new and rich ways. And certainly, last but not least, we want the work to always be conceptualized as a marathon, not a sprint. It's not about checking off a box. It's not about getting to a quick destination. It's really about committing to this work of creating these spaces that value and honor our humanity, as well as the humanity of the young adults that we're digging in with. So we need you to also prepare to accept and expect non-closure. That means you may leave with more questions than answers, which is not a bad thing. Because if we're on this journey of being committed to this work, then it's about being on a journey that leads to us you know, committing to being open as we are hearing, learning, reflecting, and growing in rich and robust ways. And as uh, we begin, I also wanted to share with you all a tool to help you know if any feel moments of dysregulation as we go through this process, because we're going to dig into some challenging content. This is a tool that comes directly from uh, Zaretta Hammond's culturally responsive teaching in the brain. It's known as the SOTA strategy. And it's a tool that I actually personally utilize in my own life to keep me together when I feel that emotional intensity going crazy. And the first step in this is you know, to stop if you can. Can you stop yourself rather than react in a habitual way? Can you take a second to observe and check yourself? Not to react, but to check yourself. Take some deep breaths and make sense of what's going on. Can you then deliberately detach and try to shift your focus you know, to pleasant or inspirational images that help calm you? And last but not least, in those moments, can you then awaken your ability to analyze and make sense of what's going on so you can show up and be present in ways that work for you? Now, we also want to conceptualize, when we talk about this work, we're in it for the long haul. This is not about a splash in the pan. This is not about one, two, three years of work. This is committing to doing work that is going to support and lift up our youth. And sometimes when we envision that work, it's kind of like a roller coaster with loops. Because there's surprises, there are things that come about that we may not expect. But again, if we're truly committed to this work, we have to understand that it's about the long haul. It's not about a splash in a pan. And in addition to that, I want to lift up the fact that in the society that we live in, a lot of people, and particularly those of us who live on social media, will say things like, success is a straight line. All you have to do is find the right cause, have the right intentions, and you'll be able to get there. Sorry, not sorry. We're going to trouble the waters today and let you know if you are engaged with work that has to deal with other human beings, then success looks like this image. Sometimes it's a little bit of a cha-cha or a two-step. You take a couple of steps forward, you think you're going in the right direction, just the cha-cha a little back and realize you need to move to the left or the right. And we want to lift up that this is a normal process in the work. 
This work is not easy. It requires our commitment and determination. So when we encounter challenges or when we realize that we have entered in the wrong way, that we've made mistakes, it's not about shaming or blaming. It's about acknowledging that we might be lost in this chasm, but as long as we continue to move forward, as long as we continue to be authentic and support those that we believe in, we'll be able to get to that place of success. And it'll be an awesome thing. Jess, do you want to add on? I, I think I like the cha-cha because I have cha-cha for 44 years. So I feel like I have to go cha-cha to the right to make sure that I make the next step. And also, as I work, am I taking everyone into consideration? Not just Jessica, not just what Jessica's experience has been, but what other experiences are. And I always make sure that I keep myself open to that because it is changing, it is evolution. The evolution of young people is mm -hmm. beautiful, but it's also like we need to take off our hats. We need to take off our hats and do something else. Absolutely. Now, we also want to declare that to do this work, we need to move above and beyond creating what's known as safe spaces. We need to normalize ensuring that there are brave spaces. And brave spaces are spaces in which we lean into discomfort opposed to stepping away from it. So with this, I'm going to ask Jessica to read this poem that's an invitation to a brave space. And I'm going to ask all of you to, alongside us, have the courage to enter into a space of bravery and commitment as we're authentic with each other in supporting this powerful work. Stand off to the side. I turned 44 and need glasses, everyone. So I'm trying to adjust to it, but it is real. Um, anything under 12 font is gone now. It's completely gone. <laughs> Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we all have caused wounds in this space. We seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard el excuse me, elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be. But it will be our brave space together, and we will work on it side by side. Beautiful. And, and I ask that every time we're feeling uncomfortable, even in this brave space, that we show back up and understand that this is safe space for us. Now, one of the first things that we want to share with you all, and when I say share with you all, is through this presentation, we'll be sharing content, but we'll also be modeling certain activities that we think are important for you all to wrestle with. And the first is what we call a welcoming activity. And we believe in beginning every engagement with human beings with a welcoming activity, an opportunity to provide all with an opportunity or chance to be seen and heard on our own terms. Um, as a former school leader, when I engaged with parents and caregivers, I always began with welcoming activities. When I engaged with my staff, whether it was a faculty meeting or professional learning community meeting, always started with a welcoming activity. As a former school teacher, same deal, always began classes with welcoming activities. And the one that we have for you this morning, I think is a pretty fun one. Because what it asks you to do is, if you have a device or a cell phone, it asks you to actually take them out and find some images that represent memories that you've had over the course of this year that were powerful. Memories that if you had the ability to just snap your fingers or if you end up finding out that you won that crazy Powerball and Mega Millions jackpot, you know, maybe those would be the places that you would go right back to. Um, and we want you to find those images and then we just want you to engage in a turn and talk where you do some sharing and listening with those around you about those fabulous spaces that you would zoom back to. And now if you don't have a device or you don't have any images, it's okay to just spend a moment in reflection and think about what those moments are that you would love to zoom back to 
and that you are prepared to share with your colleagues about. And we're going to do some modeling before you, we get you started. Uh, this image on the top is the space that I'd always like to zoom back to. It's an image of myself and my wife Haley on the beach on horses in Jamaica in August of last year. And whenever I am thinking about a place that I would rather be in, and particularly when I'm on a highway stuck in traffic, <laughs> right there. Um, and Jeff, you want to talk about yours? Yeah, yeah. So this is a picture of me and my baby. It's my daughter, Janae. Janae started her own business, her own baking business when she was 15. And so my little entrepreneur was invited to do desserts and Ayanna Presley's birthday cake. Right. Um, and so we were sitting there and she's like, mommy, no pictures, no pictures, no pictures. And I'm like, I just need one selfie. I need to capture this moment. Um, and so that was that was uh, that moment for me. And it's, it speaks so much to young people and their audacity of hope and their audacity of power and pushing through even as she was out navigating her high school years. So that's my picture. <laughs> All right, so these are our images, our moments that we'd like to zoom back to if we could. Music's a big part of what we do, so we're going to play a song. It's going to be Summertime Magic by Childish Gambino. While the song plays, I want you to engage in conversation and share and listen about those spaces that you'd like to be at. Once the song is done, our voices come on and we begin our process of digging through the content. Enjoy this first micro moment of reflection, everybody. See, now I know even though we stayed up here. We weren't walking around the room. I know that you have some powerful conversations. See, this is why I love welcoming activities. I know because there's an awesome murmur in the room right now. And looking into the audience, there were extremely uh, big grimaces and grins and smiles on your faces. So I know there was something positive that was happening back there. And I know, even though I wasn't involved in any of your conversations, that each and every single one of you got to be seen and heard on your own terms. How do I know that? Well, you had the ability to pick and choose. You got to share as much as you liked or as little as you liked. And that's the magic of a welcoming activity. It creates an opportunity that says, hey, for all participants, this may just be a space in which we'll be seen and heard and acknowledged in the ways that we want to be acknowledged. And it's one of the reasons that I always advocate for starting each engagement with a welcoming activity. And for those of you who will continue on with us in future trainings, we will show you different examples of different welcoming activities at the onset of each and every session. Now, reflection is also a dynamic, hugely important portion of this work. And oftentimes, due to pressure, no, we will not make time to reflect. Time to reflect individually, time to reflect with colleagues, a time to hear the reflections of our young adults. But we want to remind you as we begin this journey that reflection is one of the most important and critical elements of the learning process. So we're going to share a video clip with you. This is called, How Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what, the key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So three o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular, I'm about to show you a clip to, we were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So break time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you the clip. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of, like, uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace. 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that says. So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Now I start with this video clip because the work is very different when we're grounded in our whys before we get to our what's. And reflecting on that why has to be an intimate and personal decision. It has to be an intimate and personal experience. So we're going to engage in a quick micro moment of reflection before we dive any deeper. And we're going to simply ask you all to reflect on your why. You know, what is your why for this work? What is your why you know, for your time here with us together this morning? We're only going to hang in here for a couple of moments. Um, we're going to play a different song. This time it's going to be Don't Stop Believing My Journey. It's not because it's karaoke hour where I saw some smile. You know, it's as a reminder that we need to continue to believe in ourselves, our colleagues, and the young adults that we are pouring into. And with no shame, blame, or judgment, we want you to really dig in and be authentic as you reflect on that why. And when this one is done, we will take this thing out the docks and really begin digging into the rich content we have for this morning. Now, something I want to lift up. Uh, is I think about my why for this work, or share a little bit of you, with you of what grounds me in this work, is forced, first and foremost, the acknowledgement that access alone is not equity. And for me, this work is all about equity. And I always start here, because in the world that we live in, many hang their hats on access today, that it's all about access, that if we only can simply connect our young adults with the right materials and resources, then magic will happen. We've done our job. Well, I'm here to trouble the waters and say we have to go above and beyond access. Because access alone doesn't get us to equity. And access alone is not enough to create spaces that are safe and welcoming and that will treat our young adults with the respect and dignity that they deserve. See, we have to go above and beyond access to acknowledge here and make sense of what the needs are of our young adults. If we cannot do this, then the work falls short. And Jess is gonna unpack equity, because when we talk about equity, we're always talking about four components. Right, thanks, Noah. And so if we look at, at the presentation, the four, at the four parts are equitable, well, let me start, step, step back for a second. The four pieces are access, opportunities, expectations, and hope. hope. Hope is here. Hope is here forever. Um, so equitable access to inclusive environments. What does that mean? If we're going to open our doors, what do the doors look like? What does the space look like? Is everyone sort of, at, at the least of it, invited? Does everyone feel welcome in that space? Equitable opportunities to learn and grow. 
Are we creating space where if someone is hard of hearing, do they get the opportunity to be in that space? We have bilingual interpreters in here. That was incredible as I was watching. I was like, wow, you gave opportunity to young people to hear stories, to share their stories, where that's something that's missing oftentimes. Equitable expectations of being successful. I don't know about you guys, but I look at success in many different ways. Sometimes, to me, success can be just waking up in the morning. Other times, success can be someone earning their doctorate degree. And equitable feelings of belonging and hope. I want to feel like I'm here. I want to feel like you're working with me and for me. We're working together for a collective cause. And if I don't feel that way, then I'm not going to show up in that way. Now, I also look at the two bottom bullets. These are not from our perspectives as practitioners. These are from the perspectives of the young adults. Do they have equitable expectations of being successful when they are with us? Do they have equitable feelings of belonging and hope? These are things that we have to wrestle with if we're truly creating spaces that are worthy of that. Now, a great tool that I'm extremely passionate about that I believe helps with this work is wrestling with what's known as the Universal Design for Learning Framework. And this is a tool that's utilized in schools and in elements of our society all over the place. We actually live in a world that's been so universally designed for us that sometimes we lose sight of that fact. And when we think about universal design, we're not simply talking about action steps that we take. We're talking about both adaptive as well as technical components of the work. And what I mean by adaptive is we're talking about starting with our beliefs and our values that guide the work. See, everything that we do in this life is adaptive first, then technical. You know, the technical is what we do. The adaptive is what we believe. We take certain actions. We make certain decisions based on what we believe. If we are not able to build in time to reflect and to consider what we believe, then sometimes there's a mismatch in what we see manifesting itself. And when I talk about the adaptive elements of universal design, I'm always talking about the three principles that you see on the screen right now. First and foremost, acknowledging that over 30 years of neuroscience and breakthroughs in neuroscience have communicated to us that veritability, it's a rule, not an exception. That each and every single one of our brains is made up of neurons that create neural pathways that are just as unique as our individual fingerprints which means that you are always surrounded by difference. Whether you believe that you are or not, our brains are not wired in the same way. We've had different life experiences, different preferences, different ways of interpreting the world. And if we're creating circumstances for individuals that aren't just us, we have to take into consideration that if we're in a room of 30 individuals, then there are 30 different ways to interpret the experience, the materials, and things that are before us. We have to take that into consideration. Second, if we wrestle with universal design, is that we truly believe that all can work towards the same firm goals and targets. Stated differently, we actually have high expectations for everyone. And I typically add that in the world of universal design, we typically say that we don't change the target or expectation for anyone. Because we realize as soon as we change a target, we change a trajectory and individuals will always land exactly where we expect them to. See, sometimes we say, hey, this is too hard, it's too challenging, I need to give you something else. And six months later, we start racking our brains, why didn't they get to the place that I wanted to get to? It's because you sent them on a detour, because you didn't believe that they could do it. See, if we truly wrestle with this, we acknowledge the fact that we believe that each and every single individual inherently within themselves has the potential to become an expert learner, to operate at expert level if the barriers and limiting agents are removed. What's foundational and fascinating for me about this is if we truly wrestle with this, then it communicates that when we're in circumstances and we don't see our young adults shining and revealing their inner genius and brilliance, it's not because they're broken. It's not because they're bad ones. It's not because there's something a matter with them. It's because there's a barrier that's manifesting, that's stopping that inner genius from revealing itself. Even if the biggest barriers that are ever present are the invisible ones that lived in our own unchecked thinking, thoughts, biases, and assumptions about other individuals. This is one of the reasons why we communicated from the onset that reflection is so powerful. Because sometimes 
we move forward without actually taking into consideration ourselves, our thinking of the individuals that we're supporting. And we may believe that we are well-intended in our approach, but the impact may not be what we want it to be. Now, a formula that I encountered really in my years being a school leader in Massachusetts that helped me with this work. Because as a school leader, there'd be tons of times when I would be full of tears, frustration, and disappointment because I'd realize no matter what my efforts were, we weren't supporting the kids in the right way. But when I encountered this formula, it changed everything for me. And it's a formula that communicates that our values and our practices are supposed to you know, equate our outcomes. And that if the outcomes that we see are not the ones that we want, then that directly communicates that we may not be operating with the right values and we may not be matching them with the right practices, which communicates back to us if what we're seeing in terms of outcomes are not what we know they could be, then again, it's not because our young adults are broken or bad or there's anything the matter with them. It means that we have some self-work to do in reassessing our values and the practices that we're putting in place to try to get to those outcomes. And I have this image and quote from Albert Einstein on the screen because some of us who engage in this work you know, live on a regular basis his definition of insanity. Because we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results without taking into consideration if the results are not what we want. We don't just go through the same routine over and over again. We have to really have some authentic conversations about what we believe and why we believe what we believe. And some authentic conversations about what's going on with the practices that we're employing because they should be leading us to these outcomes. And if they're not, then we got some work that we gotta do because it's not about the recipients of the service, it's about the service providers getting ourselves together so we can truly ensure that we're meeting their needs. And next, I'm gonna share with you some really big questions. In fact, I consider them the going beyond access framework. And it's my belief, if we normalize wrestling with these questions, before we sit to plan, before we sit to plan in any capacity, a meeting, a program, before we sit to take into consideration an agenda for an event, that they help us to enter into spaces that ensure that we go above and beyond access as we consider meeting the needs of other individuals. The first one of those questions are, are we valuing impact over intent? No, is it a circumstance where we hang our hats on intent, where we pat ourselves on the back because we're saying we are good people who are sacrificing time, effort, energy, and emotion to try to pour into others, but we are not mindful of what it feels like to be on the receiving end of our decisions? Well, I know that we live in a society that talks a lot about everything being intentional, and it is true. We need to be intentional about the practices that we choose to employ, but your work is not about intent. It's about impact. It's about how it shows up in the hearts, minds, and lives of the young people that we're serving. And it is very plausible, impossible to have the best of intentions, yet to still wind up in circumstances where you've unintentionally inflict harm on another individual. Case in point, I can jump out of the parking lot, get in my car, get on the highway, have every intention of not getting pulled over by the state troopers, not trying to you know, break the speed limit, every intention of not getting into a car accident. So I'm doing everything I know possible to not be in one of those circumstances. I have my music turned down. I have both hands on the steering wheel. I have a laser light focused on what's ahead of me, but I blink my eyes and in a fraction of a second, someone pulls in front of me. I am not able to stop in time. I rear end them. This wasn't my intention. I did everything that I knew to do to not be in this circumstance, yet I'm still finding myself in a position in which I've inflicted harm on another individual. The work's not about intent, it's about impact. And whether the, the, the circumstances that have manifested themselves, whether they were intentional or unintentional, the impact is still the same for the individual who's on the receiving end. Next question. When we think about this work of supporting our young adults, you know, are we sure that they can see themselves reflected in our work? Or is it a circumstance of us doing things like say, all means all, all are welcome, while implicitly communicating to some that they are invisible because they never see any evidence in our practice, even in the images that they see up on walls when they enter into our facilities, that we are aware of the fact that individuals from whatever their identity markers are 
have historically contributed to our society, are currently contributing to our society, which therefore reinforces the chance or hope that we believe that they will authentically contribute in significant ways. And when I ask this question, I'm not talking about an act of politics or a simple act of kindness. Again, I'm referring to neuroscience. Because each and every single one of us as human beings has a small almond-sized gland in the middle of our brain known as the amygdala. It's that gland that's responsible for triggering that survival mode flight, fight, or freeze reaction. And when we enter into spaces, all of us as human beings, where we are not sure that our identities have been reflected, we don't know if we can authentically be safe in the space. We don't know if the individuals in this space will actually hold us in high regard or treat us with respect and dignity. So our amygdala is going to red alert. And we need to ensure if we're truly communicating that these spaces are safe, that our young people see themselves reflected. And again, it's not about a simple act of kindness or politics. It's about understanding how things work for all of us as human beings. The last question that comprises this framework is, is the work authentically relevant? Not to the service providers, but to the young people who walk through the doors. Are we communicating you know, through the work that we are doing that we are aware of what actually has importance, value, and salience in their lives? Or again, is it a circumstance of us saying, hey, I know what's important for you without taking into consideration the actual recipients of the work? I know that we have said a lot, so we're gonna bring it right back to you for another quick micro moment of reflection. You know, so I want you to next engage in a quick turn and talk. No shame, blame, or judgment, you're speaking your truths. What ahas, questions, reactions, or wonderings do you have so far? And our song for this one is gonna be Lions by Skip Molly. Enjoy your next micro moment of reflection. All right, I hope your micro moments of reflection have been powerful and that you're being authentic and transparent with each other. Um, uh, Jessica and I are gonna share some stories with you all this morning. Uh, and we're gonna share these stories for a couple of reasons. One, because our hope is that they'll speak hope and that there'll be some inspirational messages that will come through. And two, we wanna ensure at our centers that we're creating safe enough spaces for all of our young adults to be transparent and authentic and with no shame or blame, you know, to be able to be as vulnerable you know, as they can be. Uh, so we're gonna try to model this, and we're gonna model it again by sharing some stories. And I'm gonna share a little bit of my story first. And as I am talking about being vulnerable and modeling vulnerability, I do have to share with you all that going through some of the elements of my tale, um, it's gonna be challenging for me. It's gonna be anxiety provoking. You know, to share about some of these things means that I have to re-encounter some of the trauma that came from those initial experiences. And I'm gonna need your help authentically to power through and push through this. It's actually why you see me getting real close to the podium. Because when I don't feel good, I'm gonna really be hugging onto this thing and trying not to climb inside of it. And I'm gonna let you know when I'm in a moment of feeling some intense anxiety by sharing with you three words. Can I proceed? And when I share those three words with you, I really need you all in loud voices to reaffirm me with three words. Just let me know that you are with me and that this is a safe space. And the three words that I need you to affirm me with are, yes, indeed. So can we try that? Can I proceed? Yes, indeed. That sounds like people on this side of the room are with me. And it sounds like people on this side of the room want me to hit that exit sign. Let's try that again. Can I proceed? Yes, indeed. Can I proceed? Yes, indeed. That, that, that sounds better. That makes me feel like y'all got me. Now, there's a Sankofa proverb that you see on the screen. And I always begin the telling of my tale by sharing this proverb first and foremost, because I believe that it grounds me in the strength, you know, to be transparent, you know, with individuals that I haven't met before, you know, about some of the innermost intimate details of my life. And this proverb simply states, Know your story, own your story, your story is your power. And now I always begin the telling of my tale by sharing the poem Flag Salute, written by the Harlem um, Renaissance poet Esther Popple. I believe that this poem frames the world in which my journey took place in. And sadly, I believe that there's some elements of this poem that will resonate with all of you as we take into consideration the duality of experience 
that some of us encounter in this nation. So without further ado, flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag. They dragged them naked through the muddy streets, a feeble-minded black boy, and the charge, supposed assault upon an aged woman. Of the United States of America, one mile they dragged him like a sack of meal, a rope around his neck, a bloody ear left dangling by the patriotic hand of Nordic youth. The boy is 17. And to the republic for which it stands. And then they hanged his body to a tree below the window of the county judge who's pleading for that battered human flesh was stifled by the brutish, ruckus howls of men and boys and women with their babes brought out to see the bloody spectacle of murder in the style of 33. 3,000 strong they were, one nation, indivisible. To make the tale complete, they built the fire. What matters is the stuff they burnt was flesh and bone and hair and reeking gasoline. With liberty and justice, they cut the rope in bits and passed them out for souvenirs amongst the men and boys. The teeth, no doubt, on golden chains will hang about the favored necks of sweethearts, wives and daughters. Mothers, sisters, babies too, for all. Can I proceed? Yes, indeed. Now my journey actually takes place with the image of the individuals or begins with the image of the individuals we see on the right hand side of the screen. And you see a Haitian flag on the screen because I'm a proud first generation Haitian American. I'm a proud child of immigrants. My parents came here in the 50s to escape the dictatorship in Haiti and to pursue the American dream of hopefully having a better life. And Growing up, I had so much pride in this flag and what I thought it represented. So much pride in the connection to the music and the food and of my cultural heritage and of my extended family. Because I have five uncles, three aunts, and I often say way too many cousins to count. But uh, that sense of pride of my identity, it, it changed for me when I was in the fourth grade in school. And it changed for me not because of anything that my classmates would do, because my classmates were always cool. But some of my teachers, who I don't think are bad people, I thought that they were good people who were extremely well-intended, but just weren't always mindful of the impact of the decisions they would make. When they would hear about my ethnic background and they'd learn that I was Haitian, they would sometimes say things to me like, Marco, are you sure you're Haitian? Because you don't look Haitian. You don't dress Haitian. You don't smell Haitian. How could you be Haitian? And while I didn't know what they expected a Haitian to look like, sound like, dress or smell like, I got a crystal clear message that it was not okay to be Haitian, at least not in public. So I actually began concealing that element of my identity, actually until adulthood, because I knew if I simply said that I was African American, that no one would ask these really weird questions that were making me feel so uncomfortable. And I didn't understand how teachers in school of all places, these individuals who always said that they believed in me, these individuals who always said that I was the future, how could they not understand that they were saying such disrespectful stuff publicly in front of the whole class? And as I was wrestling with this, I remember a moment in which I had an epiphany. There was a little light bulb that went off over my head. Because I began looking around the classroom space and realizing, oh my gosh, all these images up on the wall, they don't look like me or any of the kids who go to school here. None of the people who work here seem connected to us or our community. And I started to think, are we supposed to be invisible? Is that the message that I should be picking up on? And at that point in school, teachers had always said there was no such thing as a bad question. So I thought it was OK to ask. You know, what's going on with representation? And when I did, I was shocked by the disrespect I was met with. Because I was often told to shut up, put my head down, put my hand down, that I was gonna get sent to the principal's office because I was asking things that nobody was supposed to ask. And I was just trying to be another troublemaker. And I just didn't understand why, as I was wrestling with identity or who I was supposed to be, why school, a place that was, I was told was supposed to be a safe space for me, well, I was starting to feel like a real miserable place where I could not be safe. And now, I'm gonna date myself a little bit because um, I grew up in the 90s, I'm a 90s baby. And um, I'm dating myself 
because I want to share that for someone who grew up in the 90s, there was no internet, Alexa, Siri, Google, social media. If you were a young person who was wrestling with issues that you thought other adults couldn't help you with, the only resource, at least I thought, that was available to provide support was network television. And when I turned on TV looking for representation, I was shocked at what I saw. Because I saw images of happy communities and happy families, but they look nothing like mine. I saw images of communities and households where there were always two parents that were present that had this incredible, loving, funny relationship and partnership that was like nothing I had ever experienced before. Two parents who always honored and acknowledged whatever gender they were assigned at birth. And I saw folks who wrestled with issues that I didn't think were issues. I saw folks who wrestled with dilemmas that I couldn't relate to. And it started to make me think, oh my gosh, this is true. We're supposed to be invisible in school. And whoever's authoring these societal messages that are showing up on TV, they're communicating the same thing. Now, this is not me saying that I didn't see images of brown men on TV in the 90s, because I certainly did. But they typically manifested in one of three archetypes. Either that of the star athlete like Michael Jordan, that of the comedian or funny guy like Eddie Murphy or Martin Lawrence, or that of the thug or tough guy like Snoop or Tupac Shakur. And while I knew that I wasn't skillful enough to imagine myself as the next NBA superstar, and I knew that while I, made, I liked making jokes, that it wasn't my gift to bring joy to the world through comedy, when I saw images of the thug or the tough guy, they resonated with me. And they resonated with me because thugs and tough guys in the community outside of school seemed like they were the only ones who were authentically safe, that they could say whatever they wanted to say, that they could go wherever they wanted to go. No one would bother them. So it started to make me think to myself, I get it. This is what I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to model my identity outside the household after. And it was fascinating for me because it seemed like some of those teachers and counselors and educators in school had mental telepathy or something. Because as soon as I started to wrestle with this, I started to hear from them with frequency. Mirko, you need to be careful how you dress. Mirko, you need to be careful what you listen to. You need to be careful who you hang out with. Because Mirko, people in this life like you don't always make it. You might end up dead or in jail one day. You might end up just being another statistic. And I couldn't take that disrespect anymore. I felt like I was only stuck in school because I had to be. And in fact, I made a confession, a decision in my heart of hearts by the time I was 13 and in the eighth grade that I was going to drop out as soon as I became a 16 year old. Because I knew in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 16 was the legal age in which you could drop out in those days. So I made a commitment that I would only be buying time in school until I could leave that wretched place. And I also made a dual commitment that I would blow up every single class and every single assembly I was ever a part of, not because I wanted to be a bad kid, but because I wanted to make sure that every other student in school with me was aware of the fact that the adults were liars that they were frauds, phonies, that they were paid to say that they cared about us, that they were paid to say that they believe in us. But watch, when we go to math class next period, I'm gonna ask her what this has to do with our lives outside of school. And I'm gonna get sent back to the principal's office. Don't you trust her, she's a liar. Or watch, last period when we had that assembly, I'm gonna ask the assistant principal about representation and I'm gonna get suspended again. Don't trust them, they're liars. Actually created a circumstance for me where by the time I was 13 and in the eighth grade, I had already been expelled from three different Boston public schools. But I didn't care because I was just buying time until I could leave that terrible place that I knew wasn't for me. Can I proceed? Yes. Now, add insult to injury, the community outside of school wasn't always a safe one. And here's a quick quote from the ACLU that I have on the screen that people of color accounted for about 75% of those stopped by the Boston police, 63% of them being black in a city where less than 25% of the population was black. And now, some of you don't worry, I'm not about to go on an anti-law enforcement rant, because I'm not that guy. I have friends and family members who are in law enforcement, and I love and respect what they do dearly. 
In my former school community, the Putnam Ave Upper School in Cambridge, Mass., I founded and was the head of school for a decade. We had this incredible proactive partnership with the Cambridge PD, where we actually had officers enroll their children as students in our school. And those same officers, they'd be before school on a playground playing basketball with kids. And then they'd be in the school building, not patrolling, but serving as tutors and mentors for kids. And they even ran their own after-school homework help center. So I know that there is tremendous potential of proactive partnerships with those in education and those in leadership and those in law enforcement. But at the same time, I do have to lift up the fact that many of us have experienced some extreme trauma at the hands of authority figures that we put trust in based on nothing other than assumptions they made about us when they saw us or assumed that they knew who we were. And I'm gonna share a quick anecdote about an experience that I had when I was 13 years old. It was the summertime, it's the month of July, and I had just finished playing a game of basketball with a group of friends. And for those of you familiar with the Boston area, we were playing hoops on the side of the Lee School on Talbot Ave, the Lee School hoops. And we were doing what I think teenage boys typically do. Uh, we were trash talking each other about who had the smooth moves and who looked like they were authentically on their way to the league and who just looked goofy and silly and like they should never ever touch a basketball again. <laughs> and I thought we were having a great time until one of my friends by the name of Deron pointed at the top of the street and said, yo, there's a DTEC cruiser at the top of the street. It's not safe, we gotta go in the building. For those of you who don't know what a DTEC cruiser is, it's just 90s Boston slang for an unmarked police detective cruiser. And when Duran said this, I was taken a little aback because my thinking was, it's hot, there's no AC in the building, we stank, I'm not trying to be confined to that area with y'all. Let's just stay out here, we're not doing anything wrong. If we run away, it looks like we're up to no good. But my friends, they sided with Duran. Their thinking was, Marco, you just trying to be a tough guy, we're gonna go in the building where it's safe, you're gonna learn your lesson. But my thoughts were, no, they're just gonna drive by, I'm gonna stand here, then I'm gonna be the one laughing at y'all. Well, my friends laughed and they chuckled. They walked up the stairs to that brick building. And as soon as the glass door of that brick building closed behind them, that cruiser, it eerily sped up and it stopped right in the middle of the street before where I was standing. And before I knew it, I got pinned to the hood of a red Honda Accord that, got, that was on the street right there by four burly officers who shouted at me. Where the guns at? Where the drugs at? And I couldn't find my voice. I was authentically in shock. I remember feeling the heat on the right side of my face from that car hood. I remember feeling the pressure on my back as I was pent there. I remember deep inside of myself trying to look for the words to say, I was just playing basketball, like smell me. The ball's right there, we're not doing anything wrong. But I couldn't find my voice. I remember feeling the inside of my ankles next getting kicked open, so I was in a wide stance. Then feeling my belt buckle roughly come undone, my pants and underwear come down, because they decided to do an anal cavity search right there in the middle of the street. Now, I'm assuming that they quickly realized that I was innocent or clean and I wasn't doing anything wrong, because just as soon as the circumstance unfolded, it was over. My underwear and pants roughly come up they jumped in their cruisers, closed the doors, and they were gone. There was no explanation as to why this had happened to me. There was no apology. I was just kind of left to sit and stew in the midst of my emotional energy. And that's what I did. I sat on that hot to lie concrete, frustrated, humiliated, angry, embarrassed. My friends quickly came outside and some of them had choice words for law enforcement. Some of them had jokes, but I couldn't say anything. I was consumed with anger and rage. I was so mad at them for watching this thing unfold and not helping me. And then I was even more mad at myself for being upset with them because I knew they couldn't help. I knew if they had gotten involved that maybe the circumstance would have even gotten worse. So I just continued to sit there on that hot concrete until I could gather the strength to stand on my feet. I couldn't even say goodbye to my friends. I just walked down the street to the nearest bus stop, jumped on the number 28 bus and went home. See, for me, it was really starting to feel like there was a conspiracy going on. That there was a narrative, a story about individuals like me, the people in the society were trying to force on me. And the only way I think I could really express what that felt like 
was to author the poem, You Ain't Nothing, that I'm going to share with you right now. You ain't nothing. Survival's a vicious game. Grab a tool, join a gang, brown boy, you ain't nothing. In the hood, you'll remain, consumed by the anger and pain. Till your blood's pouring out and on the concrete you lay slain, brown boy, you ain't nothing. Join the team, hold heat, make a life in these streets. As a predator, super menace, your worth is worthless, drop out. Life ain't for you, drop out. This world hated you before you were born, drop out. Brown boy, you ain't nothing. You weed smoking shadow dweller, pariah of society. Be angry, cause we hate you. Fear us, because we fear you. You'll never become anything, because we don't want you to, and neither do you. Brown boy, you ain't nothing. Now fast forward roughly about a year later, I felt like I had no choice but to accept this story and narrative that was written about me by these different members of our society and these different authority figures that I would encounter. And I don't know if you can identify me in this photo because I look very different now, but this is Mirko right here. The individual with that bee hat over my eye that's trying to look tough or cool or whatever I was doing when this photo was taken. And this photo was actually taken on a day in which I was skipping school with friends and hanging out in an abandoned building in our neighborhood. One of the few places that we thought was a safe space for us, where we can authentically be ourselves, where we were ditching school. You know, it was a, a building on Bicknell Street in Dorchester that had the top levels all burnt out, so it was boarded up. We had to take the boards off the windows to creep into. And I often say to folks that it was probably about 30 or 35 days after this image was taken, I got a phone call that dynamically changed my life. Because see, the call I got was my friend Deron that I shared with you all about in that previous anecdote about police. I got the call that he got shot and killed, murdered in front of his house over his white Nike Air Jordan sneakers. And when I got that call, I was crushed. Not because he was the first person I knew who was a victim of street violence, but because he was the first member of my inner circle that was ever taken from me. You know, that group of individuals that you look forward to laughing and joking with and sharing your deepest, darkest secrets with. And he was just taken. And to add insult to injury, Durant's dad was a lieutenant detective on a Boston police force. So for me, in my adolescent mind, and amongst my circle of friends, our thoughts always were, if anyone had a guaranteed chance of being safe and becoming a success, it was going to be Durant, because what his dad did for a living. So to get that call that Deron of all people got killed over his sneakers of all things in front of his house where his father, that six foot five, burly, decorated lieutenant detective of the Boston police force lie asleep in his bed, it shook me to my core. I felt like there was no way I could ever go outside and be safe unless I armed myself. So I actually did that. I purchased the gun on the street and I carried it with me wherever I went. Can I proceed? Now, luckily for me, not too long after I acquired that firearm, I got arrested with it in downtown Boston. And I remember that day vividly. I remember sitting in the back of that cruiser with tears welling up in the corner of my eyes, hearing with crystal clear clarity in the center of my brain all of the words of all of those adults and educators and other folks who ever said I was going to be a statistic. Whoever said I was going to be dead or in jail one day. Whoever said I wasn't worth it. And I remember thinking to myself and saying, oh my gosh, I've finally gone and done it. I have finally lived up to the expectations that these adults had of me. I finally gone and became a person that they always told me I would be one day. And I remember with tears streaming down my cheeks, looking at the individuals in the front and saying, please, just give me another chance. There's been so much going on. Just please, please, please forgive me. And hearing them chuckle back at me, ha ha, buddy, you blew it. You're going away for a long, long time. I'm actually going to leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger. Because me sharing a little bit of my journey was just that, sharing an example of some of the things we all experience. It's not just about Mirko. 
And what I actually am gonna charge you with now for the next five minutes or so is I want you to reflect on and celebrate your identities, your come from places, your journeys. Because if we are truly committed to creating safe and welcoming spaces that honor somebody else's humanity as a prerequisite, we have to acknowledge and celebrate our own. You are not the family that you were born into. You are not the things that you experienced along the way. You are a human being that has power and potential within yourself. And if you are authentically a human being, because I know there's some crazy AI in the world, unless you are a form of AI or an alien, you have a come from place. You have a family. You have an identity. And this is not about saying my story is better than this person's or my story doesn't have this or that. It's about celebrating and honoring you. Because if you can't do that, then you are a barrier that's getting in the way of being able to create spaces that honor other individuals. So since music's been a part of this, we're gonna play a song. It's gonna be Born This Way by Lady Gaga, because we were all born the way that we were. And while this music plays, I want you to celebrate your identity, celebrate your journey, celebrate your come from place with no shame, blame, or judgment. There's just a couple of quick pieces of information I wanna share with you before it's opportunity for you to hear Miss Jessica Castro. And if you like what I had to say, she gonna blow your minds because she blows my mind every time. Now, what I wanna lift up is, in order for us to create spaces and culture at centers that allow our young people to be transparent and vulnerable enough to speak hope and share their stories with no shame, blame, or judgment, is that we have to take into consideration the conditions of nurture. And if we're taking into consideration the conditions of nurture, we have to go all the way back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we have to understand that if our young people don't feel safe, it's not from our perspective, it's from theirs. As service providers, sorry not sorry, this might hurt somebody's feeling, but as service providers, you put in, you might not remember that you did this, but you put in a job application, you went on an interview, and you signed up for a position in which you were saying, I am here to meet the needs of another individual, which means it's not about you. It's not about me or any of you, unless you're a young adult who's in the room. It's about their perspective and how we're centering on their experience. So through their lenses, how are we sure that the space is safe? Through their lenses, how are we sure that they have a sense of belonging, they feel like they connect, and they feel like they belong in these spaces that we're cre creating? From their perspective, they can echo out to us that they believe that we hold them in high esteem. And when we see self-actualization up here, that simply means that we've met all of the fundamental basic needs so that our young people can actually show up and receive the services and supports that we have for them. Now, specifically, this notion of conditions of nurture revolves around three things, safety, inclusion, and collaboration. Again, not from the lenses of a practitioner, but the lenses of the recipient of service. Now, do our young adults feel like they are safe enough to take risk and chances with us? Do our young adults feel like they have a positive connection to our spaces. And do our young adults, we talk about collaboration, this doesn't simply mean you've created opportunities to collaborate. From their lenses, do they feel like they can work well and be successful with each other? If we can't do this, then there's no room or space for vulnerability, despite what our intentions are, and there will not be the outcomes that I'm assuming and hoping that we're looking for. Just another quick micro moment of reflection, and then you will hear from Jessica. Same broad question as before. You know, as you consider the content and the experience so far today, what questions, wonderings, connections, ahas are currently living in your brain space? We're actually only gonna hang here for two minutes, and then we're gonna move to Jessica. Song selection for this one is gonna be Beyonce's Halo. Enjoy this quick micro moment of reflection.